Welcome again, everyone, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, if you support this work, you can join the YouTube channel directly or head over to patreon.com slash AKSUM. Today, we are joined again by Dr. Benjamin Studebaker. He's a number 11th most watched video on this channel. So uh, I know you guys must love him. So he's, he's, he's back again. How are you doing? It's great to be back. Thanks for having me. No problem. I, I thought of the the campaign and actually a hat tip to the folks at Bad Faith. I was watching one of um, their hot take videos uh, on the analysis of it and seeing as they were horrified by by all parts of the situation. It was uh, it was interesting. I don't think they have the same um, strategy for leftists that you do, but they are indeed a group of leftists and they were analyzing the situation in, in California with the recall and, and the many candidates. And um, they seem to come to the conclusion that it's picking between bad and worse. And there's no good option, but there are less bad options. Before we get into the California gubernatorial stuff, I would just like, uh, so this can be semi standalone, people to hear your argument last time. And, and maybe if there are any updates, you could tell us as, as well. You made the leftist case against voting for Biden, which at, at first take for people who maybe don't understand the leftist liberal or progressive liberal divide would be confused by that. Isn't everybody blue? What's going on? Could you kind of uh, rehash that argument for us very briefly? Uh, I know it, it takes nuance. And then if you have any new thoughts on you know, the eight months of uh, President Biden's presidency so far, <laughs> we could jump into the CA. Yeah. And the basic argument is that the left gets blamed for anything that Democrats do. So when bad Democrats get elected that allow rising inequality to continue, that allow globalization to continue, uh, the left gets blamed ultimately for all of that. And it makes left-wingers less credible, less electable. Uh, these guys get labeled as socialists uh, anyway. So if you're going to elect centrists who will get labeled as socialists, then uh, that's what people are going to think socialism is. They're going to think yeah. it's the continuation of the status quo. They're not going to think it's anything radical or different or transformational. And so I heard calls of communista in uh, Florida, I believe, uh, against Biden. Yeah, yeah. So that's the idea that, that people get. And, and we've seen historically that when we vote for bad Democrats, it usually leads to a pull to the right. People who get frustrated with the status quo will then vote for right-wingers. If you don't like Jimmy Carter, you vote for Ronald Reagan. If you don't like Bill Clinton, you vote for George W. Bush. That's it's a two-party right. system. People don't have somewhere else to go. Yeah, the pendulum will will swing harder in the in the other direction. That 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 insight, um, you know, I, I think people have tried to debunk the kind of social science tests of the the marshmallow uh, regarding, you know, people trust people differently. But the the original kind of social science studies were trying to correlate one's patience in getting uh, a marshmallow with long term success. And I, I can't help thinking that that your strategy is is much like that. If you have a long term or more bullish leftist strategy, I I haven't heard anyone argue against your strategy yet. I have I haven't heard a good argument against it. The only argument against it I could think of is the is the short term is not wanting in the short term like having um I don't know if you want to call it an allergy or whatever just uh a, a lack of tolerance for any sort of even center right or whatever figure in that interim period until you get a more leftist candidate. Or maybe it's a, a lack of faith that there will be a leftist candidate that that has efficacy um, in in the polls. Now we've had a you know a little bit more than half a year of Biden so far. Um, I've I've actually been most impressed with the thing people hate the most about him, which is his pulling out of Afghanistan. It seems to be the thing that people have hated the most. And what actually surprised me about it, and maybe it shouldn't have, because some people said, although he was gung-ho about Iraq, you know, with the fallout with his son and with other consequences, uh, he had some level of regret in it, you know, and it seems to be the most leftist thing he's done. But I wonder 
you know, what you make of Afghanistan or anything else he's done. Do you, do you think it's it's gone how you predicted it and that there's going to be a harder swing right? Or has has Biden, um, you know, has he has he made any sort of moves or in the direction of, of leftism? Well, uh, on Afghanistan and and it, in a, Iraq, um, Obama pulled out of Iraq and Biden pulled out of Afghanistan, both of them carrying through withdrawal plans that had been laid out in the closing days of the prior Republican administrations. It was the second Bush administration's Iraq plan, which Bush himself says, oh, I would have deviated from that now, <laughs> uh, that Obama carried through to come out of Iraq. And it was Trump's plan, which Biden carried through to come out of Afghanistan. So these Democrats seem to need permission from Republicans before they will pull out. That's right. <laughs> That's right. How about on the domestic front? Is it is there anything that you've seen that concerns you that there's going to be a, a powerful right wing pendulum uh, either in the next election or two elections from now? Yeah, well, I, I haven't seen any transformational policy that I think is going to really bring lasting security to people's lives. Uh, the federal unemployment supplement, which is often pointed to by people on the left as, as having been really helpful, is a policy which became smaller. The benefit became smaller under Biden. And then Biden openly encouraged state governments to uh, not give that benefit or to make mm -hmm. that benefit harder to get uh, in preparation for closing it out. So the one program that I think really made a difference for people, inaugurated under Trump, it was cut in half under Biden, and now it's it's going away in September. The big 3.5 trillion bill, I did a blog post about it recently, uh, you know, huge bill, lots of stuff in it, but no signature policies, nothing really great or amazing or wonderful. And it's got a couple poison pills in it that I think leftists should really hate. You know, this this plan that Elizabeth Warren likes to move the Medicare age down to 60, lower the age. What's the age demographic of voters who are most hostile to Medicare for all? It's voters who are already on Medicare and therefore don't care if anybody else gets Medicare. They are already on Medicare, so they're not worried about the exploding cost of the healthcare system. What allowed the healthcare system to become 17% of GDP was the creation of Medicare in the 60s, which took the most vulnerable part of the population, the part that would otherwise have been most exposed to the cost and the waste of the private system, and, and removed them from that system so they no longer had a stake in it. Uh, and if we lower the age, we're going to take another cohort of people who are currently people who would very much benefit from Medicare for all and turn them into a disinterested part of the population. It seems to be politically suicidal from the point of view of that policy. Of course, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez hardly tweets about Medicare for all anymore. So maybe, maybe a lot of these guys just don't care. Yeah, that's right. It's um, it, it's almost the the classic. Um, it's funny those people on Bad Faith who had a West Wing podcast. So if you think of, you know, the West Wing as the uh, the idealist person who goes in there, but then says, "Hey, you know, Medicare for all." actually doesn't make sense because it's not viable politically. So how about Medicare for just a little bit more people? And that would make them feel good about themselves. And to your point, they're not they're Medicare for all is not the thing that they're willing to die on a hill for. That that's yeah, that's a very interesting analysis. And so to your point, and, and uh at the end of what I'm gonna say right now, please plug your blog again so people can know where to find it. But um to your point, what's happening is if the Democrats want to position themselves as the class of the work, the party of the working class, and these economic policies are not happening to them, at the same time, they're not able to rid themselves of labels like communist or socialist. Then they're going to think, well, if that's what the socialists and communists do, then perhaps the the Republicans have something that's for the working class. That's, and that's how the, the pendulum swing that you're talking about works, right? Yep, that's how it works. And that blog is, of course, BenjaminStuderbaker.com. The post that has that argument in it is called What It's Like to See Bernie Sanders in 2021. Uh, he stopped off in West Lafayette, my home state of Indiana. I went to go see him to listen to how he's selling that $3.5 trillion bill. I had all sorts of thoughts about the arguments he made. 
I would love to see a conversation between you two. If anyone can make it happen in the YouTube world or wherever else this is streaming, put Dr. Benjamin Studebaker and Bernie Sanders. Hey, if Bernie Sanders could talk to Joe Rogan, he should be able to talk to you. And I would, <laughs> I would really like to be a fly in the wall on that conversation. So I'm not just a podcaster, but a, a fan of podcasts. And you make a, a good point. You're a Midwestern man. And here I've brought you in to uh, have some insights on California. But the thing is, there is that saying, right? As California goes, so goes the rest of the United States, these here United States of America. Um, I think a lot of people were focused on the mayoral candidacy in New York and some of the interesting uh, changes in the voting process and all that. But then I think now the, the national attention of local elections has shifted back to California. I uh, was heading over to good old Nate Silver's 538 to see what it is that are the numbers so far. And right now, last I checked, it's the recall, which is uh, maybe confusing for some people. Yes means um, <laughs> there is a recall. No means there's not a recall. The keeping, which would be the no, <laughs> uh, is 51%. The yes on the recall, which would be the removal, is around 45%. So the no's have it for now, at least according to 538, but it is a barn burner. And then you have uh, of the major alternatives, you have a Democrat who's a YouTuber, but also uh, funny enough, <laughs> you, could, uh, you could tell whether or not he's a leftist sometimes by the job title. He's a, a landlord YouTuber. Uh, named Pafrath. He's around 7%. You have a, a kind of uh, a guy who always runs a Republican Cox at around 5%. And then the one who's grabbing a lot of media attention, this uh, black radio personality, Larry Elder, is around 22%. And before we talk about the kind of uh, the alternatives, I, I was wondering if your strategy also applied to gubernatorial races and, and what you make of the scene in California and the, and the recall. Yeah, yeah. So watching what's going on in California, I am thinking a lot about what happened in Illinois when Bruce Rauner was elected. Illinois is our neighbor state. We get a lot of Chicago news. You always hear about what's going on in Illinois. It's the Hoosier's favorite political show is what's going on in Illinois. Uh, and Bruce Rauner got elected as a Republican governor of Illinois. Uh, on a platform of taking Illinois in the same direction which Scott Walker was taking Wisconsin, which John Kasich was trying to take Ohio, although Kasich was somewhat less successful. He then claimed that he was a moderate and that was why he uh, had been less successful, but he was really just politically less good at his job than Scott Walker. Uh, but uh, in both cases, the direction of cutting public spending and rolling back pensions and trying to relieve pressure on state budgets. The trouble for Bruce Rauner is that Illinois is a heavily democratic state. The state legislature is heavily democratic. And Mike Madigan, the leader of the Illinois Democrats, uh, was very experienced and very well connected, had decades of, of experience in the state, and ran circles around Bruce Rauner, a businessman who had never been in politics before. Rauner couldn't do anything, couldn't even pass his own budgets. Uh, Madigan was passing budgets with super majorities over vetoes from Rauner. Uh, Rauner was getting nowhere. He looked completely ineffective. And so at the end of Rauner's term, he was chucked in favor of Pritzker, the current governor of Illinois, this uh, very large portly billionaire who gets along great with the Illinois Democrats. Uh, the Republicans in Illinois were so frustrated by Madigan that they created all sorts of negative attention and campaigned against Madigan. There's an ad you can find on YouTube called Unholy Union, where Rauner alleges that Pritzker and Madigan are, are getting gay married and it's it's uh, the devil, the, an unholy satanic gay marriage between uh, Pritzker and, and, and Madigan. Uh, Madigan ended up because of, I think in part because of all of this negative attention, succumbing eventually to corruption scandals wow. and he is now gone. So what ended up happening when you get the Republican governor is not that Illinois suddenly becomes this horrible red state uh, what happens is the Republican governor can't accomplish anything because he has no influence within the state legislature. Mm -hmm. Everybody gets horrified by the things that the Republican governor tries to do. The Republican governor is then run out of town. 
And in the course of all of this, the fighting with the state legislature causes more scrutiny to come to corporate Democrats in the state legislature. So the whole thing, while it has not made Illinois a great or wonderful or pure state by any stretch of the imagination, I think the whole thing has been much, much different from the way that people are imagining things will go if Larry Elder becomes governor of California. It is not as if Larry Elder is, is suddenly going to be able to get the California state legislature to do whatever he wants. No. Um, Larry Elder probably has even weaker political connections in California than Bruce Rauner would have had in Illinois, since Bruce Rauner had the backing of the Illinois Republican Party. And Larry Elder is just one person among many with no particular political experience or connections. Uh, so when I look at this, I'm going, okay, their whole thing, it's a fear campaign, just like it was with Trump and Biden. And they're saying that Larry Elder is Donald Trump and that Larry Elder is gonna somehow be uh, some sort of authoritarian in a Californian context. The idea that a governor is gonna be an authoritarian is even less plausible than the president being an authoritarian because a governor has even less sway with, uh, and even less control over the actual military force of the state, which is necessary to do some kind of power grab. So it's completely implausible that someone like Larry Elder would be able to establish himself as an authoritarian as a governor. That doesn't make any sense. So these Trump comparisons, I'm not sure what they, they mean other than he's an outsider figure who doesn't have a lot of political experience. If you don't like Republicans, isn't that precisely what you want? You want a, a bad, ineffective Republican who won't be able to get anything done because he doesn't know anybody and doesn't know how to do politics. That's exactly what you should want if you are someone who wants those Republicans to see their influence diminish. And the Republicans are just so anxious to get anybody in as governor of California because they never get anyone in as yeah. governor of California that they're not thinking strategically at all. Getting someone like Larry Elder in as governor of California is the quickest way to further diminish the influence of the Republican Party in California because he's going he's gonna to run the state terribly. He won't have the help from the state legislature. He would need to run it well, regardless of his level of personal competence. The state legislature hates him so much and will hate him so much that he won't get anything done. What better gift could there be to Democrats? And in the meantime, when he fights with those Democrats, the Republicans in the state are gonna uh, draw a lot of negative attention to the particular Democratic legislators who are gonna become the high profile resistance figures. And those people are gonna get looked at a little closer and maybe some of them will go. I think it could, would all be very positive if Gavin Newsom were recalled. I think that would be very helpful in all sorts of ways. And I think it would send a, a good message to the Democrats that they have to nominate better candidates and that it's not okay to have a governor who administers it, the state unemployment program so terribly that tens of billions of dollars are fraudulently wasted while huge numbers of people are unable to get their benefits that are legitimately owed to them. This guy has done a, a horrendous job of running the state. You look at almost every area of state policy and it's a complete botch job. Never mind coronavirus, which you know, I think coronavirus is a difficult issue for elected yeah. politicians to negotiate because you have people all over the spectrum and in general politicians are trying to do whatever it is that is popular. And that changes very quickly with coronavirus. People very quickly go from going, oh, I'm scared, I want more restrictions to I'm tired of these restrictions, I want things to open up. And if the policymaker moves with public opinion, then the policymaker looks inconsistent and that itself becomes another reason to be upset with the policymaker. So it's very easy for a politician to be caught out of sync with public opinion on Corona. It's a very difficult issue to manage. But even leaving that issue aside, there are so many issues where he's done an awful job and the Democrats should pay a price for that. And they should not be able to avoid paying a price by saying, oh, a Republican governor is scary. Come on, your state legislators are people who have been in office a long time. They know how to run circles around a neophyte governor who has never done this before. You let them do their job and you'll be fine. A few years later, you'll get somebody else and it'll be okay. Yeah, I think it's the aesthetic agony of that interim period. It, I'm, I'm telling you, you have a, a unique tolerance in you and I, I, I would really love to know what that is, but um, it maybe has to do with the fact that, you know, more people 
are of the liberal type than of the leftist type. And so you're used to being in the minority, whereas people who are used to being in the majority, it's very difficult for them. That that interim period of aesthetic agony is is too much to bear. And it's actually behind what's, uh, I see it so much, so many dollars. You said, what's the Trump connection? The biggest Trump connection I can tell is, you know, I think they know each other and they're friendly with each other. Um, and have the the mutual contact of uh, Stephen Miller, whom I think the LA Times tried to really harp on, and, and Larry Elder was not having it. But the big thing I see is, you know, uh, something Glenn Greenwald's been harping on a lot on Twitter. He loves throwing up the statistics of how much money MSNBC and CNN and the New York Times and the New Yorker and all these places are losing because their favorite subject has been taken off of Twitter and is not as newsworthy anymore. And so. In one sense, Larry Elder could become the the monetary boon of all of these uh, people who would feel this this. Uh, I mean, it's borderline insanity. It's the, the 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 lack of tolerance. It it fuzzies the mind. It fuzzies the mind to the point where all of the interests that you've labeled, if they are genuine interests of the people, to you know make sure that there's bread on everyone's table is going to be put aside um the the illinois stuff you said is is very interesting i had paid attention to scott walker in in wisconsin and his kind of explicit stances against public sector unions and i see that and i think larry elder himself has, has quoted that and has positioned himself as the opponent of public sector unions interestingly enough for republican police and teachers not just teachers uh, which is something to to think about in the defund com conversations. Um, but then the Illinois stuff is hilarious to me because I, the biggest Illinois stuff I had paid attention to was Blagojevich because he's uh, from my alma mater of Pepperdine. And I had seen so many people incarcerated that it's interesting to see that that sounds like a, a normal race. You'll correct me if I'm wrong. What's interesting about here in California is it's a recall and so you're saying this is ineffective for four years, which you have tolerance for. I think Elder would have about a year and a half. And with the super majorities here, they might even try to impeach him before that or to try to recall him before that, rather. And as you said, he might lead the National Guard of California. But ultimately, we have President Biden, uh, who would <laughs> be the chief over them and would be able to override. So it's a, it's a very interesting situation with even one year being intolerable. One of the fascinating things about the recall is that Newsom's campaign doesn't want his fans to vote for anyone on the, on the side because it's split into the two portions. The one is either yes recall or no recall. And then you have to pick one of the candidates, which is why you have, like I said, the Democratic YouTuber, Rap Grab, and then you have um, Cox and Elder leading, but I mean, scores of people running. W what do you make of this this strategy of his to say, don't choose anyone else? Is it just to make all focus on um, saying no to the recall? Well, I think the clear the deck strategy uh, is a Newsom strategy, but not a good strategy for the Democratic Party. The presence of prominent Democrats forces the Republicans who run to be Republicans who speak to larger sections of, of the state. If, if you think back, so I think a lot of Newsom's team is looking at what happened to Gray Davis mm -hmm. and the, that recall election in 02. And they're saying, well, it was because there was a Democratic option that people voted to recall because they thought they might get a better Democrat. Yeah. Right. And Newsom is going, well, I don't want that happening. So I'll just tell my people not to run. And we'll say, if anybody runs, you know, there, there's going to be hell to pay for them. You know, uh, my whole machine is going to completely reject anybody who runs. Right. So because of this, you know, yeah, it's true that there won't be any Democrats who might plausibly replace uh, Newsom. But when there were Democrats that were plausible in the O2 recall, it forced the Republicans who ran to be more conciliatory centrist types. So you get Schwarzenegger, who is an outsider, but someone who's going, I am, I am not a Democrat or a Republican, really. I'm an independent, you know, and he's he's trying to, I'm, you know, I care about climate change. He's trying to be in between, right? When you don't have a Democrat in the race at all, now the Republicans can do whatever they want. Now you can have all kinds of Republicans and nobody's worried about getting boxed out by a you know, semi-acceptable Democrat, right? 
so it's it's caused the quality of the Republican candidates to be, I think, much poorer from the perspective of the Democratic Party and mm -hmm. and Democratic voters in the state. So it's it's funny because it's it's a classic reason for why you should recall Newsom. This man is completely self-absorbed and he doesn't care at all about the future of the party in the state. And he's burning down the party to keep himself in. Uh, here's an opportunity for someone else in the party to come up and, and have a moment and, and get some traction going. And he won't let anybody have that opportunity. The wonderful thing about the American political system is that you can restore legitimacy for the regime, for democracy as a regime type, by getting rid of people who have become unpopular and have become liabilities for the regime. So when there's a recall election, the fact that they've managed to get a recall is pretty good evidence that the person who's being recalled has become a liability. And why would the party want someone who has become a liability to be its only face in the recall election? Uh, especially when you're going to have another election in a year and you're going to have spent the whole recall telling the whole state that Gavin Newsom is the face of the party in the state, that it's Gavin Newsom or it's Republicans. You, you don't have a very popular person in Newsom and you're going to make the party less popular by doing that. So it's a strategy which only serves the incumbent governor. It doesn't serve anybody else. Yeah, that, that makes a, a lot of sense that if there were a more leftist person, then they could argue against him from the left and potentially swing people to say, well, maybe the recall is good because we can get someone immediately better as opposed to having to wait, oh Lord, a year and a half, you know, mm. um, or, or, or less for that matter with the super majority and everything that they're, they're capable of. And, and it frustrates me because it shows that the left wingers in California are extremely deferential to the Democratic Party because very few of these people defied him and ran. And so if you look at the Democrats in the race, they're they are not the leading figures of the California left by any means. Those people all... The left in California look very, very suspect. It's very bad for the future of the left in California and as you say, as as in California, there goes the country. It just makes the left look so sycophantic and deferential to the Democratic Party and so unable to mount serious opposition to it. It's a terrible look, terrible look. Yeah, so he's, he's garnered support um, that is Newsom from the teachers' unions, and uh, he's been critiqued from the left how he's approaching homelessness. He's getting critiqued from the right by Larry Elder how he's approaching homelessness, the COVID relief in terms of monetary compensation you've mentioned. Uh, he's been a little wishy-washy on. The masks, he's got his famous dinner, which has gotten him in trouble with the, the very lobbyists with whom the, the policies have gone. And of course, the, the state is probably split 70-30 or 60-40 in in that regard and and that itself has flipped as as we remember in the, in the beginning of this all nancy pelosi one of the the major figures i think it was in the chinatown of san francisco who was uh, very anti uh, a lockdown or mask or or anything to that effect and um so yeah it's really how is he going to garner respect other than what you said the fear of giving up california and as you said, the Republicans are thirsty. They're so thirsty and hungry and desperate for a victory. Their morale is so low that they don't realize that they would have been better to have just wait until the full election and the regular cycle so that they could then get that pendulum swing in their favor for at least a full regular session because the, the sort of animosity that would be built up in a year and a half would be perhaps enough momentum to get rid of Larry Elder, even even if he wins and would get whatever incumbent bump there is. And I understand there's an incumbent bump in terms of campaign spending and, and a few other things, but uh, a incumbent of a year is, is not uh, really going to be much. This idea of rigging is interesting because I, I know I've studied presidential campaigns and there are primaries and caucuses which have all these different rules in, in various states. And some states have it so that you can vote for a party you're not registered to versus others where you could only vote in the um, in the section 
where you are registered. And this leads to other sorts of thinking where even if you're a Republican, you'll switch to Democrat. Or if you're a Democrat, you switch to Republican, whether you're in a swing state or one where you think it doesn't matter. You, you know, these are all sorts of factors. And I remember you saying um, another interesting strategy that you have is that if left wing people are in a state that's mostly red, there's no problem with running as a Republican, but using the, you know, whatever policies that you want, that you, you had a sort of functional mindset about parties. Does that mean if you were in California, let's say you wanted the recall to, to happen because you, the pendulum would swing in your favor. Have you taken a look at, you know, you said they're not the cream of the crop, but whoever is running and is there, are there any, is there anyone, do you want the YouTuber who, is there anyone you would want people to, <laughs> to swing for, or is it just a, a lost cause because the cream of the crop of California didn't run? Well, yeah, I've looked around. The cream of the crop has, has not run. Uh, and by cream of the crop, I don't necessarily mean the best people. I mean, the people who uh, combine having some level of ability with also being able to get along well enough with this state legislature to be able to do anything such that they can stick around. And, and the trouble is there's just, I don't think there's anybody here. This is a state legislature that's overwhelmingly democratic. The democratic party in the state completely lined up behind Newsom. I think anybody who wins out of this recall will be stymied and that the politics that that person is associated with will be discredited. So I would almost prefer that the winner be someone who is as far away from my politics as possible. Mm -hmm. someone who has very little in common with me so that my politics will in no way be damaged by the inevitable dumpster fire that will be the year after Newsom is replaced by whoever it is. Uh, and, and the only way that it could backfire is if, you know, as you, as you suggested earlier, the Democrats try immediately to recall or, or Where he had the lowest approval was the point when he was ex proposal, his health care proposal, and people went, Oh, wait a minute, I, I didn't vote for Trump so I could use my health care so that rich people could get a tax cut. Uh, that's what the Democrats would need to do with whoever. It is who wins, let them put up a budget and then go. Everybody, this budget cuts things that you care about. Isn't that awful? All of his farms and then let the people of Illinois get upset about them. Dr. Benjamin, you cut out a little bit on uh, my end there. The The last big thing I was hearing you say was that it the only way it could backfire is if they were to try to recall him immediately. Sorry, could you rehash the, the last 15 seconds there? Hello. There we go. Sorry about that. Came off the rails a little bit, but it's back. Yeah, no problem. I can, yeah, I can I can hear you now. Sorry, the the last kind of fifteen to thirty seconds there, you were saying um, that the only way that your strategy would backfire of having the pendulum swing is if they were to successfully recall Larry Elder after Larry Elder won. Mm. Um, but then it got caught off, uh, cut off a little bit. Yeah, if they get obsessed with Larry Elder and they try to bring him down in impeachment or a recall and they make the entire thing about how he is so repellent to them, then he'll get to continue to look like an outsider who is clearing out a swamp. Their most effective strategy is to allow him to propose a budget. Once he proposes a budget, all of the things he wants to do, all of the stuff he wants to cut can be unpopular. Uh, that's what 
the lowest point of popularity in Trump's presidency was all about. It was, let's repeal and replace Obamacare and let's cut taxes on the rich. And people looked at those policies and went, wait a minute, I, that's not what I thought I was getting with this guy. Uh, that's not what I thought was going to happen. And his approval went all the way down to 35, 36 on the 538 during that stretch. You know, and a similar, similarly in Illinois, Rauner puts out his budget, puts out this whole big list of reforms he wants to do. And the Yeah, so similarly in Illinois, Rauner puts out his budget and put it in front of the state of Illinois, put out all the reforms he wanted to do. And Madigan sat back and let him do that for a while uh, and let people decide they didn't like the policy rather than making it all about Rauner as this bad person who had shown up and was was corrupt or was right wing or, or whatever. He just let Rauner's policies gradually diminish his popularity. Because whenever you run as an outsider, people are projecting themselves onto you. They're projecting an image of what you're going to be able to do. And very often you can't actually do those things. You have to let people get disappointed and let people get disillusioned by outsiders if you're an insider and you want to win. You can't just immediately go after them and not give them a chance to even articulate what they want to do. So if the Democrats prevent uh, somebody like Elder from even articulating what he wants to do, that would be the only way that they could increase his popularity. <laughs> yeah, that, that's ironic. Um, I, I like on this channel to do a lot of evergreen topics. Obviously, this is is topical. I've brought you on a couple of times for topical issues. It's very important. But even when I do things that are topical, I try to make them evergreen. And one of the things that I think about, especially because you know you studied political science, especially political theory, I wonder what you think because you know when we're talking about these mechanisms as mechanisms that preserve the idea of this governance of this democracy or this democratic republic, which which has features, uh, for example, in California of direct democracy where the populace is able to vote and sometimes overturn the legislature, but also has, you know, more oligarchical representations as, um, you know, the senators were, uh, especially into before 1913, when it used to be the, the state Senate that chose the senators. But even nowadays, the idea of the Senate versus the House of Representatives is uh, it's not really like a, an idea of pure democracy. I wonder what you make of this recall mechanism. I haven't studied all the states, so I don't know, you know, how 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 uh, prevalent it is. But what do you think of this feature? Because I've seen a lot of people raising complaints and grievances. Those who don't have the sort of uh, whether it's you know long suffering patience, uh, indifference, or nonchalance that you have in, in being able to let these people actually play out their policies that would not be liked by the populace that they're allegedly representing. Um, they have been complaining about the recall as anti-democratic, as what about all those voters who voted for Newsom and now some guy who's at 18% or 21% could win rather than getting some sort of 51% or 60%. Do you view the recall as anti-democratic or do you view it as an accountability mechanism that is uh, available in a democracy? Well, it depends on how you conceptualize democracy and people tend to change the way they conceptualize it depending on what they wanna do. The recall mechanism was originally introduced by progressives and it was introduced by progressives to make it easier for someone to become governor of California without the support of big money interests, right? And you can see how this, this does work that way. The people who are running for governor of California are people who would never imagine they could win in a straightforward election where they have to get the support of one of the two parties. These are people who only have a chance to become governor of California because it's a recall, right? So they're people who don't have the support of the political machines. Now, this means that if they win, they're going to have a really hard time actually running the state. Schwarzenegger was very careful to try to make nice with the Californian political establishment after he won because otherwise the state would have been ungovernable and his political career would have been a big waste of his time. Yeah, I met right? I met him uh, once he came for the Duke of Edinburgh presented an award at my high school to a few people who had done whatever 
the achievements were to unlock that. And he came and he visited us. He was a little shorter than I thought. He was about 5'11", not 6'2", or 6'3". And what I do remember from that time is that right before the proposition on cannabis, uh, full, full legalization, which ended up failing with a very close margin, he decriminalized cannabis. And I also remember he allowed licenses for undocumented people. So those are definitely two things you don't expect Republicans to do. So that that absolutely bolsters your point. Yeah. Yeah, I think that when you think about how you structure a democratic system, you have a couple of different things that you're trying to do. You know, one is is effectiveness. You know, one is having a system which can actually govern, and the other is legitimacy, right? Of having a system which strikes people as acceptable, as fair, right? And the thing is, oftentimes, if you follow certain intuitively attractive principles for what constitutes a democratic system, you may end up with something which doesn't actually work, right? Mm. And in the name of making something more democratic, you may make something that's more dysfunctional, right? Uh, and similarly, you know, democratic institutions can favor credibility or they can favor dynamism, the ability to change things, dynamism versus the predictability of a credible set of rules, right? Uh, and if you favor one or the other too much, you can make a system which is dysfunctional. Right? So when we think about functionality, you can have a system which is incapable of changing, which is undynamic, or you can have a system which changes too much, is too unreliable, and therefore lacks credibility. Right? So you have to balance legitimacy with functionality, and within functionality, you have to balance credibility and dynamism. But most of the time when people think about, do I want this particular democratic reform, they just ask, does it sound fair to me? Right. And they don't ask these other questions about what will be the substantive material effects of that reform on the performance of the system, on the kinds of decisions that it issues. And because of this, you can get into situations where you have institutions that don't fit together well, which individually sound attractive, but don't fit together well. And the recall is a great example, because while the recall allows people who aren't conventional Democrats or Republicans to get in, it does not give them state legislatures mm -hmm. that are likely to work with them. So it creates a situation where it's very difficult for that governor to then actually govern the state unless you happen to be exceptionally talented and willing to water down what you're proposing to do substantially. So you have to have a, a mix of, of those things. And the, the California and the universities in California have a big focus on radical democracy, direct democracy, deliberative democracy. All of that is very big at Berkeley, Stanford, right? But when they install these reforms, they're installing them in a system that was designed to work a different way, right? And those reforms, while individually they're attractive, they don't always fit well with the existing structure and therefore lead to problems with governability. And I think most of the problems in California that we've seen over the past several decades have been mainly governability problems to do with adding these radical uh, direct democratic reforms to a representative system without changing that representative system fundamentally. And the more of these direct democratic reforms you add, everybody who adds them is thinking this will make California run better. But because they don't sync up with the rest of the Californian political system, they tend to lead to just more more trouble, you know, having referendums which can change tax rates or change expenditure unilaterally without the governor and the state legislature being happy with those changes. Mm -hmm. They have visions that they were elected to carry out which conflict with the things that the voters are making them do in the referenda, right? All of this creates governability problems, credibility problems, and dynamism problems, right? So you know, my, my attitude is not that it's, that a recall is necessarily a good thing or a bad thing, but that all of the features of a political system have to fit together so that it can accomplish certain purposes that political systems have. And when you throw different things together that don't fit, those things lock up and the system becomes dysfunctional, not because any particular one is bad, but because you've picked a bunch of stuff from lots of different places that don't fit together neatly as a whole. So when you think about a particular reform to democratic institutions, the question has gotta be, how does this fit together with everything else. Yeah, it's a it's a delicate process when you speak of credibility and dynamism. I'm reminded of some of the founders looking through their dusty history books at the time at the 
Greco and Roman experiments at the Italian, you know, the Venetian, the, the Florentine experiments in democracy. And, and even in that, that period that I think a lot of people skip over, uh, maybe the Hamilton musical reminded them of it, but this kind of uh, Articles of Confederation period. Sometimes people fast forward a lot from like 1776 to 1789 or 90 uh, without realizing that too kind of went under their experience. And a, a lot of these these changes happening, but as you said, trying to make sure all the pieces match, not not being dogmatically attached to any of them as being either democratic or anti-democratic, but viewing the the functioning governance or the good governance along with the the credibility as two things to to be guides. So ultimately it's not something that is automated, but there needs to be a human being making judgments there about how that balance actually um plays out so yeah no thank you for that that's that's very interesting was was there anything else about what you see going on in california that you thought would be either representative of or a sign of of things to to come in in your home state of indiana or or elsewhere in the United States, or any other closing thoughts that you had on on these subjects that we covered? Well, I think that a lot of governors uh, have stayed out of the coronavirus mess by being slow about what they do and waiting, right? There's a set of governors, and I'm thinking mainly of DeSantis, Newsom, Cuomo, who looked at coronavirus as an opportunity to shine. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that coronavirus is not an opportunity to shine. It's a political nightmare because it's frustratingly mid-level. It's not obvious enough to enough people that you that coronavirus is really, really horrible. So there's always going to be some people who are going to think you're going too far in trying to stop it. And conversely, coronavirus is too serious for you to do nothing and look okay doing nothing, right? Because it's frustratingly mid-level and it comes in waves, it will sometimes look like it's a very big deal and it will sometimes look like it's no deal at all. So whatever coronavirus policy you become known for, there will come a time when you will need to change it, right? And when that time comes, because you have married your public image and your political image to a particular suite of coronavirus policies, you're not going to want to change it. It will be very bad for you if you do change it. You'll be married to a particular approach. And the governors who were smartest didn't think, oh, I'm going to use coronavirus to get myself elected to the presidency. They thought, this is a bomb. This is a political nightmare. And I'm going to make sure that every time we make a move, we're in the middle group of states that are moving when it seems reasonable to move. So that nobody thinks that I'm crazy uh, hard, hard on the virus or crazy soft on the virus so that nobody can really argue that I'm particularly bad in any given direction. So it's these sets of states that waited two or three weeks before they locked down and waited two or three weeks before they opened, but didn't wait two or three months, right? The states that were slow. Holcomb in Indiana, our governor, was one such governor. He always waited a little bit and let mm -hmm. other states be, and other governors be the public faces of either locking down or opening up. And that's a much smarter long-term political strategy. Any governor who tried to use coronavirus to make a political career for uh, themselves, I look at that person and I go, this is someone who is unsavvy. And for me, it's a hint that that's not somebody that we should get behind in the future, regardless of whether it's a Democrat or Republican, a loud reopener or a loud closer downer. Thank you. Thank you for that, that voice of of gradualism or incrementalism or or slow change and uh, thank you again for helping us californians get a few of your of your two thoughts <laughs> of your two cents regarding our issues here thanks a bunch it was wonderful being back on